everything you use to refine us, to uh, bring us closer to you, to conform us to the image of your Son. And God, all this is possible because of your amazing grace, because of your forgiveness offered through the cross. God, that all of us have a, a right to claim just because you offer, not because of anything we do, not because of anything we are, not because of anything we deserve, but just simply, God, you love us, and you provided a way back to you, and now you use everything to mold us into your people, to uh, qualify us for the works that you set aside for us. And God, all you ask is that we just respond to your great love and your tremendous grace. So God, we uh, continue here this morning to open our hearts, our eyes, and our ears to you, to hear from you this morning through, through the word brought to us. And God, help us continue to respond to your amazing love. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whew. Love that. That's one of my favorite songs. Um, that last song, Waymaker. Um, good morning, Access Church family. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you online for joining us here this morning for our service. Um, it's just such a, a, a pleasure to be with you this morning and, and bring God's word to you. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Garrett. Um, I'm, a, I'm a board member and a church member here at Access Church um, for pretty long time and it's just been a, a blessing to be here and just serve and just continue to see what God is doing and how God is moving and using uh, his body uh, here at Access Church and this morning uh, just sharing God's heart with us I, I want to ask uh, a simple question and uh, we're going to bring back church uh, uh, some school this morning and uh, just with a raise of hands I want to ask a question who here considers themselves to be blessed? Raise of hands. Online, you got that uh, raise hand emoji. If you want to, go for it. Um, who here considers themselves blessed? Yes. Ooh, yes. And then I want to ask why. Why do you consider yourself blessed? What makes you blessed? Yeah. Not how much? Child of God. Yeah? Yeah. So... The reason why I want to really clarify the word blessed before we get into this call uh, that God calls his people to, and it's down at, it started thousands of years ago when he called Abram, or Abraham as we later know him as, to lead his people. And the word blessed has been so distorted and used out of context from its original meaning as we find throughout the word of God. The world as we live in today sometimes considers themselves blessed when they have accomplished something, you know, that was important to them. Um, they may sometimes consider themselves blessed when something good happens to them or, or when they're standing in front of a brand new car and saying, God provide this, I feel blessed. Um, material things, things of that nature. But this morning, let's clarify that word because if you look at it from the dictionary, just our dictionary standpoint, not even talking about the biblical term. The standard definition of blessed says made holy, consecrated. Another kind of biblical definition going a little deeper, it's basically you are blessed when you are being in a right standing relationship with God. When you are in a right standing relationship with God, that is why we are blessed. Not because of what we have, what good things have happened to us. You see, we could do good things, but that doesn't make us blessed. We could do good things to other people. Good and blessed are two different things. God bless. God blesses, not us. We could do good things, but if Christ isn't in us doing it, it's not blessed. Amen. It's just us doing a, a good thing to our common neighbor or whatever, or for our fellow church member. But when we are blessed, we are in the presence of God. Yes. That's what makes us holy, right? Christ in us. That's the definition, made holy. Yes. We are made holy only because of the Holy Spirit in us. Yes. That is why we are blessed. Amen. 
not because of anything that's around us, but it's because of who we allow to come and live in us. Yes. Great wealth nor fame, neither circumstances nor material things can determine a person's state of being blessed. It isn't about what you have that makes you blessed, but rather who you have that determines if you're blessed. Amen. Blessings are just a byproduct of being blessed. God may bless you, give you blessings because he is with you, not because of anything you or I do. 1 Peter 4.14 says this, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You see, you're blessed because of the spirit of God resting on you. He's upon you. That is what makes you blessed. So this morning, church, I just want to refocus our attention and make sure that those of us online listening and those here, we understand what blessed is. Because when we look on our social media accounts, all throughout social media, man, it's so easy to have a distorted view of the world of what blessed means. And so, God, I feel the Holy Spirit just wants to remind us why we're blessed. We're blessed because we have him. No other reason. No other reason other than that. The Lord blesses us that we could be a blessing. He loves us so that we can love others. He instructs us so that we can instruct others. He comforts us so that we can comfort others. And the list goes on. Now that we've clarified what the true definition of what being blessed is, I want us to look at a call that God placed on his people thousands of years ago, starting in Genesis, when, um, when he called Abram, later known as Abraham, to lead his people. And we're going to look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 from the New Living Translation, and it says this, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So you, here you have, have a, you have a man in Abram, Abraham, who is being told to leave everything he knows. His family, his hometown, and go. Leave it all and go. Talk about charted waters, uncertainty. <clears throat> we all have been there when we had the Holy Spirit press upon us to do something. And even if it brings us out of our comfort zone, we need to be obedient to do it. And it started with Abraham. Now let's fast forward thousands of years later when Paul is talking to the Galatian church and he says this in Galatians chapter 3 verse 14. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. You see this generational call started with Abraham and was fulfilled through Jesus Christ and it continues Till this very day through you and I with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Too often in our world today, God's people view God's way of living as optional. But God is with us to remind us this morning that all of us chose to carry the name of Jesus. And it's not an option anymore. That's right. It became our obligation. When we said yes to God, we gave up our right to decide. We now let Christ in us decide. Amen? Yes. Amen? It's not our option anymore. That's right. We treat God's, sometimes God's word as like it's optional. Mm -hmm. When he calls us to do something, when he asks us to be obedient in things, we act like it's optional. Mm -hmm. When we chose, he didn't force us to love him, to choose him. Love demands a choice. Because if it if, if it didn't, it's not true love, and God can't lie. God said he is love, so he doesn't force us to love him. 
Love demands a choice. So we chose to open our hearts and our minds and our life to Jesus, and we said yes. And when we did that, we gave up our right. It's not our option anymore. It's Christ in us to decide. <clears throat> It's our obligation to be obedient. I think about Galatians 2.20. It's one of, one of my life verses, and I know it's one of Pastor Renee's. And it's funny, my, ver my life verse came uh, about when I did uh, like one year of uh, Bible quizzing. Uh, it was like one time. And uh, I remember when I was uh, getting ready, and we were going over the questions of what are the questions that are going to be asked. I remember, man, I didn't learn much. But uh, I learned one thing, and I memorized Galatians 2.20. And uh, it came to help me later on in life when I was at a, a, a church retreat where you actually, one of the concerts that I wanted to get into to see one of my favorite Christian bands at the time, uh, in order to get in, you had to quote a Bible verse to get in. And I was like, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of Man who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, you see, I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live this out by faith. I believe by faith that he is doing whatever he wants to do through me. This morning, I believe God wants us to be reminded of this generational call and to be honest with ourselves about where we measure up concerning this call. God doesn't simply bless us just so we walk around as God's people and say, yeah, I'm blessed. I don't know about you, but I'm blessed. I am blessed with our chest puffed out. We're God's people. I don't know about you. Too bad for you if you're not. Maybe one day. And we go about our, our, our way. That's not how God intended it to be. We are blessed so that now we can be a blessing to others and hope that they become blessed because they'll become blessed right when they have the presence of God in and among them. Amen? Amen. So, this, so this call that started with Abraham, we're going to talk about three questions to ask ourselves this morning that will challenge us to become better and more intentional at living out this call to be a blessing. And the first question I want us to ask ourselves is how often are you an extension of God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness to others? How often or frequent are you an extension of God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness to others? It all starts with an extension of grace. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. Grace can be defined, it's literally God's undeserved favor towards us that we've done absolutely nothing to earn or deserve. That's it. We've done nothing to deserve or earn that grace. Romans While, God, hold on, while God's grace was free to us as a gift, it cost God everything. Grace was giving and given in a remarkable way through Jesus Christ. It cost God everything. It cost us nothing. It cost you listening online nothing. But it cost God Romans chapter 5 verse 15 says this, But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Since grace is a free gift paid for by someone else, this is why grace sometimes can be hard for you and I to freely accept and embrace. I don't know about you, but I was taught from a young age, right? I'm pretty sure most of us were, that you have to work hard for what you want. Nothing is free in life. We have to earn it, right? Ah, oh, man, I remember those words when I was growing up and, you know, 
parents, whether it's parents, a, an adult, a coach, man, you have to earn your way. Nothing is free. Nothing is free in life. And so that is why we are taught with that kind of upbringing. And so when we receive a, a gift that is free and we didn't do anything to earn or deserve it, that's why it's uncomfortable. That's why it causes us this, this, just this feeling inside because we're not used to that. We feel like we had to earn it. Okay, what can I do to pay him back, right? Oh, gosh, uh, it's Christmas time and someone got me a gift and I didn't get them one. Oh, let's go get one, right? It makes us feel uncomfortable. But if we fail to recognize grace this morning as a gift, then we fall into this trap of thinking it's something we can earn. Putting us then in a place that I refer to as the performance treadmill. Let me, let me explain this. See, a, a treadmill is an exercise machine that allows you to run or walk. Um, right now, probably in my whole life, it's probably more on walking, maybe with an incline. I don't know about running. Um, I'm pretty sure Pastor Renee would go for that too, but I don't know if she'd do the incline. <laughs> someone, it's when someone or runs or walks in place on a belt that continuously moves, right? And even though the person is accumulating steps, they are absolutely going nowhere. They are moving nowhere, but they're continuously moving. Physically going nowhere. We think that sometimes, somehow, some way that our activity for God will get us closer to God. It's like we try to earn that grace. We try to earn that love. And the list goes on. But our activity doesn't get us closer to God. Our relationship does. Yes. Our, act, our activity of God is because we want to now be obedient because we love God. We have a relationship with him. We don't do it out of obligation. We do it because we love him. And it propel, that love propels us to be obedient, to be involved in what he's doing. We, the problem is, is that if we get stuck on that performance treadmill, we go nowhere spiritually. We become stagnant spiritually. And what happens to water when it becomes stagnant? It starts to smell. You do not want to be around it. It's the same. When we get... When we get on this performance treadmill, like we can earn our way to heaven, we can earn things from God, we can do this, we can do that, we get in all this activity, we lose sight of the relationship. And so I encourage us this morning, get off that treadmill if you're on it. There is nothing you can do to earn that grace. It's a free gift. You just have to, you just have to accept it and then be an extension of it. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, this is the perfect verse to describe God's grace to us. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Man, when you do something to someone else in this, in this world, how, how quickly do the, they kind of avoid you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Until you apologize or, hey, where's so-and-so? Man, you haven't seen them for a month and then you found out that you hurt their feelings or you offended them. Right? It's kind of like that. But see, even while we were still sinning, even when we were doing wrong to God, God still loved us. God still wanted a relationship with us. It's the complete opposite of how we deal with things. God's grace is never a license to sin, but instead an opportunity to become a distributor of that same grace you received. When we remember how much we need grace, man, it's so much easier to give grace. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you have a hard time uh, extending grace, mercy, and forgiveness to people, man, just remember how much it was offered to you. If God's grace is a gift accompanied by his forgiveness and, uh, and mercy that we don't deserve and did nothing for, then tell me why we still like to dictate who we extend it to. Sorry. God did that to me too when I'm jotting notes and I'm like, Ugh, ouch. Man, we do though. We feel we have a right. Oh uh, man, Garrett, but you don't know. You don't know what that person did to me. You don't know how they treated me. You don't know what they have done to me. 
I don't. You're absolutely right. I don't. But God does. And remember, that gift was free to you. Who are you to determine if it's not free to someone else? Christ died for that. And what you're saying by withholding it is what they did to you was not good enough on the cross to take it away. So don't miss out on the opportunity to be a blessing and allow God to do the same thing through you for someone who may be in need of that same grace. Okay? Don't do that. We are called to be a blessing and, and, and being an, an extension of his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness gives, us, gives him the opportunity in us to be that blessing right. to someone who needs it. Question two that I want us to ponder. Are you a superficial or sacrificial giver to God? Amen, Bree. <laughs> superficial giving can be defined as this. It's giving within your means. Sacrificial giving can be defined as giving beyond our means. You see, when I say giving, people naturally, including myself sometimes, not all the time, they think of money. They think of money. Turn that off, guys. Turn that off. That's not all that I'm talking about here. The biggest, the biggest difference between superficial and sacrificial giving is that one stretches the, the faith muscle while well, the muscle, the faith muscle while the other doesn't. Right. For example, like Pastor Renee talked about last week, endurance, mm -hmm. right? She talked about in her sermon how faith is like a muscle that needs to be exercised and stretched out on a regular basis. With these two types of giving, only one stretches that faith muscle. The other is within our means. We don't need faith. We got it. 2 Corinthians 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, Paul says, They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, but they are also filled with ab abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it on their own free will. Okay, they gave, they gave them themselves. Time, talent, treasure, right? That's what we like to talk about in church. Just not, just not about, it's not about your treasure. It's about those other things. So only you, only you know what a stretch is beyond your means when it comes to giving in your time, talent, and treasure, right? Only you know that. Our time, talent, and our treasure are all valuable to us. So I want to look at these areas a little more intently and how we can practice being more of a superficial giver in these areas, which will, um, which will cause us then to just be a blessing to others. So let's look at our time first. Man, we love our time. It's important to us because it's, it's, it's one area, it's the one area of the three where we can't get it back, right? right? Man, once it's over, it's done. It's finished. It's, it's, it's not coming back. We can't get that time back. This is why it's valuable to us. In this area, a sacrificial giver sacrifices their valuable time, making time to spend with God and are active in kingdom work. What does your quality, with with, what does your quality time with God look like? I want you to think about that for a second. What does your quality of time look like with God? And then think about it from a relational standpoint, from humans. Do you think that quality time that you're spending with God makes your relationship healthy or not? Is it a healthy relationship or is it not? Yes, it is. Okay. The good thing is, is like I said, we're able to, in our relationships with each other, we could look upon each other's relationships and say, man, I don't spend hardly any time, and that's not healthy, right? It's the same thing with God. If you're not spending quality time with him, allowing him to move in you and to stir in you and to change you, it's not healthy. It's not the way God designed it. So is, is it a relationship that you would look upon as healthy? What kingdom work are you involved in? I want to ask that too. What kingdom work are you involved in? Kingdom work 
It's not about you. It's about God. It's about God enhancing the kingdom. And it's intentional. Let's move along to our talent. God has given us all different gifts, even spiritual gifts, abilities, and talent, so that we would use them for the building and edification of his kingdom, not just to further our own agendas, right? Yes. It's just not about furthering ourselves, but it's about putting those talent and abilities to use to draw people. To re Remember, God's whole purpose is to reconcile a lost world back to him. So that they are blessed. So that they are blessed. In this area, a sacrificial giver is an active participant within the body of Christ. Allowing God to have full access to their talent when he needs them. They are not spectators who hide them and or use them only, to, only for personal gain in the world. Their own agenda. I want to go back. It was it was some time ago. Our our church, uh, man, it was a while ago. Our church uh, some time ago did a study on a book written by Pastor Kyle Eidelman called uh, Not a Fan. Anybody remember that study? Yeah. Not a Fan? Yeah. Mm. I remember within that book we learned that God wasn't out to just have fans. In fact, he probably has too many fans. He needs active participants on the field. Fans don't get on the field where their talent and abilities can get used. They just cheer on those on the field doing all the work. And I want to encourage us this morning to get on the field and get involved somewhere in what God is doing and, and be an active participant and allow God to use that talent and that ability that he's given you to help the church, to help his people. That is one way you can, that God can be a blessing through you. In order to be a blessing, we must become more um, sacrificial in all areas of our life. And this last one, uh, treasure that we'll talk about. This might be the area where most of us struggle to give sacrificially. And this is because this is the one area of the three where we feel like we deserve it the most. Because, right, we earned it. We earned it. Man, I worked 60 hours this week. I earned that paycheck. The treasure's mine, right? We feel like we did something to actually deserve it. So this is why it's hard to sacrificially give um, in this area. In this area, the sacrificial giver gives back to God first before doing anything else with it. We in the church refer to this as our first fruits. Let me give you an illustration of a, a tithing experience that happened to my family. Um, when my wife and I got married, we, would, we, we gave, but I, I would say we weren't faithful at all. I know we weren't faithful at all. It was more of honestly like tipping, you know, tipping God, um, and just doing what we can, just doing what we could. And, and literally, we would pay our bills first and pay our responsibilities first. And then what started happening was, wait, where'd all the money go? Where, where's it at? Uh, there's nothing left to give, give God. Just danger. Leftovers. Just what's left. And that's not how God designed it to be. And so um, if you don't get on board with how God, is, is how God operates... Um, and if you don't humble yourself and try to change those areas of your life that need changing, he'll do it for you. Exactly. Um, and I really feel that God used uh, me. I mean, it was a tough situation um, um, being let go from, a, from my job at some point um, to really be in a humble state where, man, we needed help. And it was a humbling experience. But there was people that came alongside us and wherever we needed help. Whatever we needed, man, they helped us out. <laughs> yeah, for you. Um, they helped. And, and through that process, man, now that we're in such a different place, and, uh, and the job I'm at now is, is just amazing and I love it, but, man, we don't even think twice about it. God taught us how to give our first fruits to him and what that means and how we do that. And so now... Uh, thank, thanks to the Tidely app, 
Those online and those here. Man, I love that app. So every, I mean, every other Friday when I get paid, I mean, I'm able to just be like, oh yeah, do our tithe. And before anything else comes out, and it works out every time. I couldn't tell you how. Um, my wife's the one that usually does the numbers, and she'll say, oh, this is what he got paid, and this, this is what's going to be deducted for this pay period and this period. But that's how God designed it. Give back first to him what, what he asked for, and then he'll bless you. He'll bless you. In order to be a blessing, we must become more sacrificial in all three areas. The more we do this, the more opportunity we give God the opportunity to be a blessing through us for those inside and outside the church, just like people were to us when we needed it. And the third and final point, um, the question that I want us to ask ourselves in this, in this generational call to be a blessing this morning is, this one was kind of tough for me because um, I was talking to my wife about it and uh, I, I just had different questions on that third question and then God like he always does the Holy Spirit just worked it out and it became very intentional and I was like wow okay the third question I want us to ask ourselves this morning is do you strive to love God like he wants to be loved I never really thought about that <laughs> um, and let me give you an example of this there was a book a long time ago Oh, man, this is going to age me and my marriage, and I don't want to say this. So it's called The Five Local Languages, right? Um, we went through this uh, premarital counseling, right? Yeah, right? Yeah, premarital counseling. And um, basically this book is about how we each have a love tank, a, a love tank this imaginary love tank that, that, that is filled when people do things for us that make us feel most loved. And it was about finding your love language to help your spouse fill that love tank for you. Make sense? Yes. And there was five, five love languages. And they were um, gifts, acts of service, quality time, affection, and words of affirmation. Okay? And then my wife and I, early on in our marriage, uh, there became this love language problem dilemma going on. And I'm sure we're not alone, but it was, it was fun. And my wife would say that I dealt with it more than she did, which she's probably right. So let me give you an example of what I mean when I say, do you strive to love God the way he wants to be loved, right? Just like us, we want to be loved at what makes us feel loved mostly. Like there's things, there's ways that we desire to be loved. And so my wife, her love language is uh, words of affirmation, okay? I thought mine used to be quality time, but it's not. Through time and just knowing me, it's affection. Let's keep it G-rated. It's affection, okay? Um, <laughs> mine is affection, okay? Uh, what happens, sometimes what happens is when our love tanks aren't being filled, we begin to love other people or our spouse like we want to be loved in hopes to get what we need from them. Instead of loving them how they desire to be loved. Let me give you an example. It would be like me showing my wife tons of affection, right? Hugging, kissing, just holding hands, just all this affection because I desire that from her, right? So I'm gonna do that even though that's not her love language. That's not how she feels, that's not what fills her love tank. It's words of affirmation. But I do that in hopes that she'll do that back to me because mine's low and I want it to be filled. Or it's like my wife uh, giving me tons of compliments that even though that I'd, I'd love that, uh, uh, just because she's trying to fill her love tank, right? You're doing the opposite of what you should be doing. Instead of doing what you need to do with how that person desires to be loved. Does it make sense? Yes. So how does God want to be loved by us? I want to look at uh, some verses. 2 John 1, 6, the first part of that says, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. Luke uh, chapter 10, verse 27, which we're all pretty familiar with, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. 
and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. John 14, chapter, uh, John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I believe God wants us to love him with this unwavering, relentless, uh, I think of the song, type of love in hopes that that same love through time leads us to obedience in all areas of our life. And it's through that obedience then we become blessed and we have encounter blessings. All throughout the word of God, God blesses and rewards obedience. You see it throughout the word of God. I'll just give us some, um, some scripture that, to support that. Um, Genesis chapter 22 verse 18 says and through your descendants all of the nations of, of the earth will be blessed all because you have obeyed Jesus replied in Luke chapter 11 verse 28 but even more blessed are, are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice see blessed because you obey you are blessed because you're being obedient and then uh, finally, this one that sums it up, and I even highlighted some of the words because I want to go over this little, this little formula that you could say from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 16. It says, for I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. See, the formula is this, as I highlighted. It was in order in Deuteronomy 30, 16. First thing, love the Lord your God. Then what? Walk in obedience. Then, then you will be, God will bless you, right? So the formula is love plus obedience equals blessed or blessings. When you love God the way he wants to be loved, that propels you to be obedient. And then that brings about blessings. If, you, if we truly love God like he wants us to, then our obedience will naturally follow. And blessings will occur through our obedience. And I'm here this morning, hear me right here. It's hard to say something like this um, because we all struggle. No one's greater than his master, right? We can only be in his likeness. But hear this. If you are struggling to be obedient to God, you may be loving something more than God. Just like when Jesus asked, do you love me more than these? You may be, something lo you may be loving something more than God. I don't know what that is, but if you're struggling to be obedient in your life, you're loving something more than God first. God, you're not loving God the way God wants to be loved. So in conclusion, we got these response cards. If you got it, I always want to mention these too. Um, yep. Maybe you're here this morning or you're watching online and you don't think that this message was for you because you don't consider yourself a believer or you don't consider yourself to be a part of the church. And so this generational call doesn't pertain to you. I'm not sure. But I'm here to tell you that there is a message for you. It's just a different call. You see, the God, God is calling you and extending to you the gift of his grace. That's your call this morning to respond to that. Remember that undeserved favor that none of us deserve or earned. God's grace is summed up like this, like I said earlier. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. You will never find that type of love, only in him. So I pray that you accept that free gift here this morning. God is extending to you, and you let us know about it either online or in this card and put it in the back. And then to the rest of us, the church. I want to take it, um, I want to use binoculars as an example. Example. Me? To close. Yeah, Bree, you ever do binoculars? 
Um, binoculars' sole purpose is to allow us as individuals to see things far, from far away more clearly, right? Thanks be to God this morning that he refocused our eyes and attention on how to be a blessing. This call, it's a generational call, but all of us need reminders. Some more than others. I'll be the first, I'll be the first to say. Uh, I need a lot of reminders. Um, I, I forget things a lot. Um, and it's, and it's, it's so enjoyable. I, I pray you hear my sarcasm behind it. It's so enjoyable to be married to someone who doesn't forget, who actually remembers everything, who actually remembers things probably two, three, 10, 15 years ago. Um, it's always in that arsenal if she needs it. Yep. No, I'm just kidding. We all have struggles. And so if I forget something, she's quick to help me remember. Or if I'm saying, I didn't say that, no, you said that. Remember when we were in the kitchen and it was two weeks? I'm like, huh? What? I don't remember that at all. I don't remember that. Um, but we all need reminders. Thank God. Thank God. One of the greatest things about binoculars is that they allow us to see so far ahead that we can even catch potential problems before they happen. If you're hiking, if you're doing something, if you're hunting, or I don't know, you can see, oh, there's that ridge there, and it shows you potential things that might be an issue, right? Yep. So I ask us, the church this morning, what is preventing you from truly living out this call of being a blessing? Maybe you have heard, maybe, maybe you heard this morning and, and you have a hard time with extending grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And you continue to be the dictating person of extending it. Because, remember, Garrett, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how bad they hurt me. There's no way I can extend that grace. There's no way I can forgive them. There's no way... There's no way, there's no way. There is a way. There's only one way. And it's the same way it happened to you. It's through being an extension of that grace that God gave you and giving it and extending it to someone else. Maybe that's you this morning and you have a hard time with that and that's preventing God in you from being a blessing to other people. Or maybe there's an area in your life that lacks sac sacrificial giving and God is calling it out this morning, desiring you to stretch that faith muscle going beyond your means so that he can be a blessing through you in that area of your life to others. Or maybe it's an, obedient, an obedience issue. Is God pointing out an area of your life that you continue to just dis, be disobedient to? Or maybe you didn't know and God is bringing it to your attention now. Remember, if you're being honest with yourself, maybe the lack of obedience to God is because you, I'll put it some other way. You love the sin more than you love the Savior right now. Jesus. Mm, dangerous waters. <laughs> I mean, I've been there. I had to make choices where, is this more important to me? Endeavoring in this or endeavoring in God? And, 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 and being blessed. And, uh, and being an extension of that blessing to others. I don't know what it is for you, but you do. Um, and God wants to restore you and deal with whatever the issue is so that he can continue being a blessing through you to whoever he needs to without any obstructions or limitations. I encourage us all to not look for the blessing, but to be the blessing. Remember, our blessing as believers already came in the form of Jesus Christ. That was our blessing who changed and transformed us in order that we now might be a blessing with his presence abiding in us. Amen. I encourage you this morning, if, if, uh, if you need to fill something out and put it in there, people will be praying for you throughout this week. But I pray that just like the illustration of the treadmill, God loves us enough that he doesn't allow us to stay stagnant. He will draw out things in our life that need to change because his whole purpose in life is to, is to make us more like his son. That's what he's out to do. And that's a never, a never changing thing. He's always gonna be doing that with us because we're just an imperfect people, right? 
So I just pray this morning that you will just be honest and that you will um, be moved um, by the Holy Spirit to change those certain things in your life so that he can truly be a blessing through you. Uh, let me pray for us this morning. Dear Lord, I just come before you this morning and I just want to thank you for, for being an extension of, of your grace to me that you reached out and extended that grace. And even though, Lord, there was times where I continued to not take it and prolong the start of our journey together, I, I did. And it changed me. And then with that came your forgiveness and your mercy. And so, Lord, I just thank you for that. I thank you for us in the church that, Lord, we are able to call ourselves a blessed people because nothing more than being your children and knowing that your presence lives and abides in us. That is why we're blessed. And so, Lord, I just, I just pray that you will help each and every one of us to truly re refocus and be reminded about this generational call to be a blessing. And what areas in our life need to change in order for you to continue to be a blessing through us? So in hopes that others may come to be blessed through that blessing. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to help us here at Access, giving us opportunities to be a blessing to our community and to each other. Because that call that started with Abraham is twofold. How we can be a blessing to each other and how we can be a blessing to to those outside these four walls. And so I thank you for the opportunity that you've presented to us. And I just pray, God, that uh, you will be with each and every person here and that you will be with each and every person listening online. And just may you just continue to draw us into a, into a deeper relationship with you where we become more dependent upon you. As the Apostle Paul said, may you increase it as I decrease. We give you honor and praise this morning for what you have spoken to us and what you have shared with us from your heart. We love you and we thank you and we give you honor and praise for only you deserve it, Jesus, for what you did on the cross for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.